and amen. Uh, the Bible's theme, if we were to take the Bible and ask most people what is the theme, some people would say the cross, and the cross is no doubt the greatest event, the cross and the resurrection in human history. Uh, but the theme of the Bible really isn't even the cross. As important to us as our salvation is, that's not the overall theme of the Bible. Uh, it's a great theme. It's the most important theme when it comes to our salvation, the empty tomb, of course. Uh, but the theme of the Bible is really about a king and a kingdom. The crucifixion of Jesus leads up to Jesus becoming the king of kings and lord of lords. From Genesis to Revelation, the whole Bible is about a king and a kingdom. That's why Jesus taught so many parables and stories about the kingdom of God. In fact, in the Gospels, you hear about the kingdom of God in some passage, the kingdom of heaven in others, and sometimes there's, they're the same, but most of the time they're not the same. There's the difference, a big difference in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Uh, the kingdom of God, meaning that, uh, that, that when we're saved, we're part of the kingdom of God. But the kingdom of heaven is going to be a place here on earth where Jesus Christ is going to rule as King of kings and Lord of lords. Uh, Jesus knew that, obviously, in his earthly life, not just as God, but I'm talking about as a human, as a man. And so he understood that, as we'll see tonight. The prophecies that were foretold long before he was ever born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. And he knew that he had a role as the coming king, even though his first coming, his first advent, was not to be our king. Of course, he is our king tonight, even though he's not ruling on the throne of David. He's still our king, and he's still king, but he's coming to rule as king of kings and lord of lords. When we get to Revelation, we see that Revelation 11, 15, everything, you hear me say this a lot, but everything in prophecy, everything we hear in the news, everything that we hear about the Middle East, everything prophetically is actually moving towards something. It's not just happening. It's not just taking place. It's taking place and it's happening because of something and for something. It's moving towards an event. And the event is going to be when Jesus rules on the throne of David in Jerusalem as our king. That was long foretold, long before he was ever even born. In fact, I'll show you that tonight before we get into all this about the Davidic covenant because it's all connected. Look in the book of Isaiah. I know you know this passage, but I want you to see it. It's Isaiah chapter number 9 about the birth of Jesus Christ. We use this passage all the time at Christmas, but I want you to see verse 6 and 7 of Isaiah chapter number 9. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. By the way, let's stop and say this, because I'm going to bring this up in a moment in our lesson tonight. But the Old Testament knew that God was going to have a son. That's not something that was hidden. That's something that was well understood. Even the Pharisees of Jesus' day, the Sadducees, all of them, understood that God had a son. Verse 6 reminds us of that. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Well, that didn't happen in his first coming. The government crucified him. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. People, I, I see it all over right now. People say, Jesus never claimed to be God. Jesus never claimed to be God. He certainly did. And the Bible declares him to be God. And prophetically, he's called the Everlasting, capital F, Father. So there's no mistaking who he was. He's God in the flesh. He's God, but as a son. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Look in verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment, with justice from henceforth, even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Folks, that either we have to say Isaiah didn't know what he's talking about or it has a future fulfillment. I pick the latter. Because none of that except him being called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, him being born, none of the rest of it took place 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem and throughout Israel and through Judea and that area when Jesus walked around Galilee for 33 and a half years. He didn't sit upon the throne of David. He was crucified. So this is the first coming and second coming in two verses Really in the first verse, verse 6, in one verse, both 
advents are found in one verse with just a period or a comma in between 2,000 plus years of prophecy in human history. Uh, Jesus is coming back, but notice he's connected with his government upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it. Jesus said when he taught us to pray in Matthew chapter, uh, what is it, Matthew 4, uh, is it Matthew 4 or Matthew 6? Why don't you all look it up? Jesus said, when you pray, and we know our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He taught us to pray that way, that we're to pray for his kingdom to come. And now some people will say, well, his kingdom coming, that's just getting saved. No, that's not getting saved. That's part of the kingdom, but the actual kingdom coming is not in heaven. It's as it is in heaven on earth. We're going to heaven when we die. But we're also going to rule and reign with him on the earth. So that, that is Jesus telling us to pray for the kingdom to come. And the kingdom is the emphasis of the Bible. It's the emphasis of the Old Testament. It's the emphasis of the New Testament. It's all pointing towards Jesus getting his kingdom. The whole Bible is about a paradise lost and a paradise regained. It's about a king that, that, that's going to get a kingdom again. And Jesus is going to get the kingdom, and he's going to take this kingdom away from the devil, who is the God of this world. Jesus is the prince of peace. Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. And so he's going to take his kingdom from him, and he's going to rule. What a day that's going to be, by the way. What a moment that's going to be. There's not going to be any elections when that happens. God's not going to ask for political opinion. There's not going to be any debates. There's not going to be any you know, a round table discussions or, you know, uh, the town hall meetings and we're not going to go cast ballots. He's going to be, it's like a dictatorship. But he is the potentate. He is the king of kings. And he's going to rule, it's going to be a monarchy. And it's going to be a theocracy because he's going to get the throne of his father, David. I'm going to explain that as best I can tonight and next week. But he's going to get the throne of David and he's going to rule out of Jerusalem. So either we have to believe the Bible tonight or we have to believe what we're being taught and, and brainwashed by the world tonight. And here's what I choose to do. I choose to believe the Bible. Like I preach Sunday night, I, I look at it like this. This book, this book is above me. It's above my opinions. It's above my ideas. It's above my ideologies. It's above my my theologies, it's above my principles and my feelings. This book is so important that God gave it to us that it's above my wife and my children. It's above my mother and my father and your mother and your father. It's above our church. It's above our government. This book's more important than our Constitution as the United States of America. This book is that important. And so we've got to line ourselves up with what this book teaches or, or don't. And I, I want to line up with what the book teaches. And the book teaches us that there is a Davidic covenant. And the covenant is going to be connected not just with David, but his seed and a throne, a literal, physical, visible throne in a literal, physical, visible kingdom where a literal, visible, visible physical king is going to rule. And that king is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we looked at the Mosaic Covenant, they're connected somewhat with the Davidic Covenant because David is a Jew, and he's under Jewish law. And that's why our Bible, we got 39 Old Testament books that are primarily written by Jews, for Jews, under the law, and it ends in the book of Malachi with the words, a curse. Then there's a, a, a change. There's about 400 years, they call it the silent years, you probably have heard of that before, between uh, Malachi, or at least the time of the prophets like Malachi, um, and between that and the birth of Jesus Christ. 400 plus years, silent years, silent meaning that there was no new scriptures, no new prophecies, no new revelations, until Jesus is proclaimed to be born by the angel Gabriel, and Mary gives birth to Jesus Christ in Bethlehem, and then we have the gospel account. And in fact, even the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are written to Jews, by Jews, for Jews, up until 
the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus is crucified, up to that point, by the way, they're still under the law. Even though there is a change between the Old and the New Testament, they're still under the Old Testament law. That's why they're going to synagogues. That's why Peter and Paul are, are having discussions after the gospel. In fact, uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, whether Jews and Gentiles should have to obey the law and the keeping of the law and all of that, they're still under the law until Jesus rises from the dead. When he rises, he's been crucified and he rises from the dead and the gospel now is spreading out. Now, we're now not under the law. Now there's a transition. And the transition becomes primarily to the church age, even though the church age still is mixed with Jews and Gentiles in it. But after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, from that point forward, you're dealing with a mixture of Jews and Gentiles, but you still have books that are written directly to Jews. For example, the book of James. James is a Jew writing to Jews. James is servant of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. So he's writing as a Jew to the Jews. Uh, but the, the reason I make that point tonight is because all of it is emphasizing the covenants of the past leading up to the Mosaic covenant. We could spend a month just on the Mosaic covenant. I feel like I didn't do it justice, but I can't spend all my time in one covenant or we'd be here two or three months just in one and so I'd encourage you, get a good study Bible. Um, and I recommend Schofield. I recommend Thompson Chain. They're about two of the best. Get, but there's so many good resources out there, online resources, books, you name it, that can help you study the covenants even further and more thoroughly. Just be careful because everything online doesn't mean it's in line with the Bible. And everything you see on the Internet and even on television doesn't mean it's in line with the Bible. Um, a good illustration of that is Luna and I were watching a program I think it was on Amazon Prime. Uh, I think it was about Noah and the Flood. And it was just a phenomenal uh, documentary. It, it's just well made, very well made. I mean, we, we were just in awe. And solid as it could be, doctrinally, biblically. And I thought, well, I, they, they cut it off. And I thought, I'm waiting for what's next. And I remember telling her, I said, I wish there was a part two. We'll come to find out there is a part two. There's a whole series. So we started watching part two. And now that you've watched part one, you realize in part two what they were doing. They're luring you in. Part two brings it up to speed where it was emphasizing Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, uh, was it Seventh-day Adventists or, or the Church of Christ? I can't remember now. One of the two. And they were promoting their founder's prophecies and, and, uh, and how you know, he was so correct on so many different things. And the rest of it was just about his prophecies connected with the, the world and the, and the church age and the end of time and he had predicted dates that the Lord was supposed to return and it didn't turn out that, that time and now they figured out that they, he had miscalculated by uh, looking at something he shouldn't have looked at in this passage over here trying to explain away because you know that's how it works you can false prophesy anything and just say oops I forgot something or I left something out and, and just make another book or another movie but I was really disappointed because the first one was good, and then the second one shows you what it was all about. Underlining all of that was their belief system. And they were trying to, you know, promote their belief system and, and brainwashing their belief system. So you do have to be careful, but there are great resources out there. Um, but here we're talking about David, and David is uh, receiving a covenant as a Jew under the law by God. When David shows up, God says to him, I'm going to give you the sure mercies of David. And I'll not take it away from you like I did those before you. Look in 1 Chronicles chapter 17. We've got a lot of scripture tonight. 1 Chronicles chapter 17 and verse 13. And here the Lord speaking says, I will be his father, and he shall be my son, and I will not take away my mercy from him as I took it from him that was before thee. So God's speaking to David about David's offspring and reminding David of his mercy. And he said, I, I'm giving you mercy. The Bible calls it, we'll see later, the sure mercies of David. And God says, I'm going to give you something I didn't give the, the one before you. The one before him was Saul. And Saul, God didn't give him the sure mercies to him. In fact, Saul, God took his spirit from him. And uh, Saul disobeyed God, and Saul went against God, and so God removed his spirit. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit wasn't permanent in the Old Testament as we have it tonight. And so Saul died, 
backslidden. He died uh, at, not as a friend of God, but as an enemy of God. He died as a suicide, in fact, trying to... Um, he begged God back for uh, his, his blessing and his mercy, and God wouldn't give it to him because of his sin. But God said, I'm not going to do that to David. David was God's pick. We're going to see that tonight also. And so God's prophetically telling David that he's going to give his descendants a special blessing, a special covenant, a special promise. Uh, if you would look tonight in Psalms chapter 2. Psalms chapter 2 will be kind of where we're really going to kick this off. Psalms chapter number 2. Um, I just preached not long ago in Psalms chapter number 1. Blessed is a man that walketh not the counsel of the godly. But you have to remember, all the Psalms are not just inspirational and, and motivational psalms and devotional psalms there's there's just as much prophecy in psalms as there is in the book of revelation psalms is a prophetic book and it's filled with prophecies about the first and second coming of jesus christ we see some of that in psalms chapter 2 we see in this chapter that god makes a statement that he's going to give a son to David, who's going to be a king on a throne that's a supernatural son, a supernatural king on a supernatural throne, even though it will be a physical throne. And uh, we'll jump down to verse number 6 for time's sake tonight. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I for, uh, begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. And the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Now let's stop here and, and make a couple comments. When he says in verse 6, Yet if I set my king upon my holy hill Zion, this can't be just David. Because he says my king, so it's, it's, it's David, but it's not David. You're going to see David and, and, and the prophecies about Jesus Christ kind of go back and forth so much that it's hard to distinguish between the two. Uh, he said, upon my holy hill Zion, uh, he, he says, I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. Notice it's a capital S. If you have a good a Bible tonight, it should be a capital S right there. Thou art my son. And most references to a son of any offspring is a lowercase. So this is prophetic about Jesus Christ. This day have I begotten thee. That's important. Because David is a born son, but this is going to be a begotten son. And uh, I'll explain that here shortly. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the other most part of the earth for thy possession. David didn't get that. None of that happened with David. David won battles. David was a man of war. He won a lot of battles, but he didn't get the uttermost parts of the earth for possession. When the Bible says uttermost parts of the earth, he's talking about Asia and Africa and, and Europe and all in Americas all all of that at that time those places still existed whether they were heavily populated or not but he said I'm going to give it to this king well it can't be just David he didn't get all of that look in verse number nine thou shalt break them with a rod of iron sounds familiar the Bible says of Jesus Christ when he returns he's going to rule with the rod of iron thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, capital S again, lest he be angry. He's not talking about kissing uh, David's children. Uh, lest he be angry and you perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are they that put their trust in him. That's not talking about David. That's talking about the Lord. You're not blessed by putting your trust in David. You're blessed by putting your trust in the Lord. And we know that that's not David because back in verse number 2 of this chapter, he's called God's anointed, and yet it's David, but then it's not David. You see, as David, and, and if you look at chapter number 2, it says a psalm of the king, and this is supposedly a psalm that David wrote. David writes about himself, and then he writes about prophecies about Christ and himself almost interchangeably. But he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So nothing that David's writing is wrong. None of it is, is uh, arrogant. None of it is blasphemous. None of those things. It's because David understood that God had made a covenant with him and through him 
Jesus Christ would one day rule upon the throne. Now, I'll show you that even in the New Testament. Look in the book of Acts, chapter number 2. As early as Acts, chapter number 2, we see this same thing. <clears throat> we need to see tonight why God made a covenant with David and why David was going to have a son before we get into the covenant itself. Acts, chapter 2, and verse 25. For David speaketh concerning him. Pay attention to what he's, the wording here. David speaketh concerning him. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, verse 27, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will I suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Jump down to verse 31. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. The writer of Acts says this. He said, David writes this prophetically of himself. We know that because David speaketh concerning him in verse number 25. But then he says, Thou will not leave the Holy One to see corruption. You will not leave my soul in hell, neither I suffer the Holy One to see corruption. This cannot be David speaking about himself because David... His body went to the grave. He didn't resurrect from the grave. And in fact, that's what uh, the writer uh, of uh, the New Testament says that. He says that his, his uh, sepulcher is with us to this day. They knew where David's tomb is. In fact, to this day, they know where David's tomb is. So he's talking about himself, but then he's talking about thine holy one. Uh David says this in one of the Psalms, they pierced my hands and my feet. They never pierced David's hands and feet. David died an old man, pretty much in, in good health up until the very end, and he's, he's dying, uh, uh, he's old, and, and he can't stay warm and things like that, but he, uh, he, he wasn't shot with an arrow, he wasn't stabbed with the sword, he wasn't nailed to nothing. When he says they pierce my hands and my feet, either David's lying or he's prophetically saying something about someone else. And that's exactly what it is. He's speaking about Jesus who's coming prophetically who will have his hands and feet pierced. He's a type of Jesus Christ. Go back to Acts chapter 2 and look down in verse 29. Men and brethren, let me speak freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. For he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath unto him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. You see that tonight? Not just walk the streets of Jerusalem, but to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Here, he, he, he says David was a prophet. Jesus hold, holds three offices, is what the, we usually call it. He holds uh, the office of a prophet, a priest, and a king. There's only a couple other men in the Bible that held all three. You find some prophets, but they're not priests, they're not kings. You find priests, but they're not prophets or kings. You find kings that were neither prophet. Uh, uh, nor priest but David was a prophet a priest and a king David acted as a priest throughout his life uh, on several occasions in fact going in and getting the show bread and all that the reason why God allowed that to happen is because God allowed him to act as a priest temporarily he was a prophet he prophesied many prophecies about uh, uh, the second coming and about the birth of Jesus Christ and the crucifixion and other things uh, Moses was also a prophet, priest, and king. Um, the Bible says in, uh, in the first five books of Moses that he was called a king out in the wilderness. They looked at him as a king. And so there's several that, that fulfills that office. Jesus in the past was a prophet. Presently, he's our great high priest. When he returns, he's coming back as our king. All three are going to be evident. But we see that in the story here of Acts chapter 2 where he's pointing the Jews, those Jews that knew the Old Testament. And as he's preaching, he's saying, Men and brethren, let me freely speak. He said David was a patriarch, but David understood that his offspring, he's going to sit on the throne and he's the son of God and he's not going to be left in hell. His Holy One's not going to see corruption. He's going to rise from the dead. This is Jesus. 
Christ is going to sit on the throne. In verse 34 of Acts chapter 2, For David is not ascended into heaven, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. The Lord said unto my Lord, capital L-O-R-D, said unto my capital L-O-R-D, but the O-R-D is not capital, but the L is capital. This is God speaking to God. This is God himself speaking to his son. And yet David is speaking himself to his son. So this becomes a mystery. Um, I'll skip ahead a little bit to say this. That's what Jesus really got the Pharisees all in a, in a bind. They didn't know what to do when he asked them. He says, and I'll show you the scripture here in a minute. But he asked him, he says, how is it that David said unto his son, and he quotes the scripture here, my Lord said unto, unto his Lord, sit thou on my right hand, thou make the enemies thy footstool, and they couldn't answer it. There's no way for them to answer it. They didn't know what to say. Because a, a father would never have called himself capital L-O-R-D, that's Jehovah God, and he would never refer to his son as God. And uh, especially in the Oriental cultures, the Oriental cultures, I mean, that's just unheard of, uh, and the Jews are part of that, and, uh, and any Oriental uh, culture knows that the children are not superior to the parents or the grandparents. And the same is true in the Jewish culture. Uh, the children are not superior. It's only in American culture, Western culture, where we treat our kids as equals. You don't find that overseas. You don't find any Asian culture where the children have more rights than the parents or the grandparents. You never heard of such a thing. And the Jews understood that well because that's how they raised their children. They learned that from the Old Testament. And so this was a, uh, a paradox to them. How could this have been possible? Well, look in Romans chapter number 1. Romans chapter number 1 and verse 1 through 4. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Verse 3. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection of the dead. Verse number 4 is one of the greatest verses in the New Testament on the proof of the deity of Jesus Christ. The proof of his deity was not walking on the water. Now, I don't think he could have done that without being God. But that's not the proof of his deity. The proof of the deity of Jesus Christ was not the signs and wonders. The devil's going to do signs and wonders. The Antichrist is going to do signs and wonders. The proof of Jesus being God is verse 4, the resurrection from the dead. That proved Jesus is who he professed to be, the Son of God. But he said, prophetically, he promised before of his prophets, Paul says in Romans chapter 1, concerning his son Jesus Christ, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. So prophetically, in the Old Testament, David's going to have a seed. This is part of the covenant. And the seed, the offspring of David in the flesh is going to be not just a man, not just a human being, but it's going to be the Son of God. It's one of the greatest mysteries of the New Testament. Now, we need to understand tonight, and I know I'm talking to y'all, you probably all understand this without any question, but we have to understand prophetically, that's what Paul's saying, God has a Son. You say, well, why do you got to tell us that? Because there's religions tonight that do not believe God has a Son. These are religions that believe in God and believe in Jesus but they don't believe Jesus is God's son. And in fact, the Muslims tonight don't believe that Jesus was the son of God. They believe he was a prophet, but they don't believe he's the son of God. And other religions don't believe he's the son of God. And yet the Bible says that God has a son. And in fact, God has all kinds of sons. God has a son that he begat by the Holy Spirit. And God has sons that are created and God has sons that are born. For example, angels are called sons of God. Adam is called the son of God. David is called in the scriptures a son of God. You and I as believers are called sons of God. But Jesus is the only begotten son of God. 
John chapter 1 verse 12 says this, But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Here's a quick test tonight. Here's the proof of your salvation. Do you believe on the name of Jesus Christ? Then you have power to be the son of God. You're sons of God. That's your assurance. It's as simple as that. To as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So if you believed on his name and you believe he's the son of God, then by the power of God, you're now a son of God. This was known in the Old Testament, and this is known in the writers of the New Testament, and you have to be careful because the new translations, I know everybody gets sometimes get tired of me bringing this stuff up, but you have to understand why they're doing what they're doing. In John 3, 16, the Bible says, in the King James Bible, it says this, uh, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. In the new Bibles, they said his one and only son. Jesus is not God's one and only son. Jesus is God's only begotten son. You are a son of God. I just gave you scripture on it. So if they're saying God only has one son, and, and don't say, well, that's not what they meant. That's what it says then John 1 verse 12 is not true. God has many sons, but he only had one that's begotten, and that's Jesus Christ. Let me show you in the Old Testament. You don't have to turn to all these references, but you can write them down. Daniel chapter 3, very familiar passage. Shadrach, Meshach, in the, uh, and Abednego goes in the fiery furnace. They're already in the fire. Nebuchadnezzar in verse number 24 says, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished or stonied, that means uh, uh, like a stone, he's petrified, and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto him, uh, unto the king, True, O king, verse 25, he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. That's a reference to the Son of God, Jesus Christ, in the Old Testament. Same thing. The new translations have changed it. The new translations say in Daniel chapter 3, verse 24, and the form of the fourth is like unto a son of the gods. You say, does it matter? Well, let's again do a little test. Are you saved tonight by believing Jesus is the Son of God or a son of the gods? Can you get to heaven by believing he is a son of the gods? Then it's important. That's, one of the, that's a, a great proof of the deity of Jesus Christ, what they call often a, a Christophany in the Old Testament, an appearance, a reference to, uh, to the Lord in the Old, uh, Old Testament, and they change it from the Son of God, capital S, Son of God, capital G, to a son, lower S, of the lower G gods. Nebuchadnezzar understood that God has a son. You say, how could he have possibly know that? Because he lived around 606 B.C. And the writers before him, he had access to writing uh, uh, the Old Testament. He had access uh, to the uh, influence of the Jewish believers. In fact, you had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You had Daniel there. He had access to the book of Job and other, other scriptures that were there that proclaimed that God has a son. This isn't something hidden in the Old Testament. I'll show you another one, Proverbs chapter 30. Most of the Proverbs are written by Solomon, but we get to Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 1 through 4. Verse 1 through 4 is a man by the name of Agur, or however you want to pronounce his name. That's how I always pronounced it. The words of Agur, the son of Jekeh, even the prophecy. So here's the prophecy. The man spake unto Ithiel, even unto Ithiel and Ukal. Aren't you glad your name is what your name is tonight? Verse 2, Proverbs 30. Surely I am more brutish than any man, and have not the understanding of a man. I have neither learned wisdom nor have the knowledge of the holy. Who hath ascended up into heaven, or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? He's talking about God here. This, this is profound to me. God gathers the wind in his fists. If you went back to Proverbs chapter 1, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 1 that the Lord has his way in the whirlwind, the clouds are the dust of his feet, and uh, the Lord will mock when our fear cometh and, uh, and all of that. Uh, God controls everything. Now, some things the devil gives, is given permission, but I remember when one of the hurricanes did a lot of damage, I think it was the one in New Orleans several years back, 
and there was uh, well-known, you know, preachers on television, evangelists, whatever you call them, uh, like Pat Robinson took a lot of heat. And I'm not a big Pat Robertson fan, but when he's right, he's right. And he said that this happened as a result of the knowledge of God and all. And they said, oh, God would never send a hurricane. Listen, there's not a hurricane. There's not a, there's not a thunderstorm that doesn't happen under God's knowledge. He knows all about it. He has the wind in his fist who hath bound the waters in a garment. This gets into a, a subject that's a very you know, deep sub subject about outer space, the waters of the garment, not just the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans. There is more water above our head between us and the throne of God and the firmament of heaven. Uh, the oceans of our earth is not even a drop in the bucket compared to what the Bible teaches about the great deep that NASA's never discovered and probably never will, but God tells us it's there. But he binds up the waters in a garment. Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? The writer of Proverbs here says this. God's doing all of this. God laid the foundation of the earth. He's the one that controls the wind. He controls all that. What is his name? What is his son's name? They knew God was going to have a son. They knew that. Job chapter number 1. Here's a, again, Job is probably my favorite book of the Old Testament, and it's hard for me to say which one's my favorite. But I, I just really love the book of Job. Always have. Job, if you want to know about creation, read Genesis chapter 1. But you better read Genesis chapter 1 with Job 38 in hand. Because Job 38 is God speaking. If You know in the New Testament, how many of y'all have the words of, of Christ in red in the New Testament? Almost everybody in here. If you were going to have words of God in red in the Old Testament, Job 38 would be in red. Uh, but I'll get to that in a second. I want you to see Job uh, chapter 1 first. In Job chapter number 1, the Bible says um, in verse number 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Look in chapter number 2. Verse number 1, again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. The sons of God in the Old Testament is always a reference to angels. So when you have in Proverbs 30, him talking about what is God's son's name, he's not talking about angels. When you have Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar talking about the son of God, he's not talking about angels. And we know that again by looking in, in Job 38, like I said, this whole chapter should be in red. Because it's God speaking. And when God says this, it doesn't matter what my opinion is or what I've been taught or a book I picked up or, or read or anything else. This is what God says about it. In, in Job chapter 38, verse number 4, where, God speaking here says, Where wast thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. So he's predating creation. He said, Where were you? I was there before creation. Verse 5, who hath laid the measure thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? And who laid the cornerstone thereof? All that stuff I take absolutely 100% literal tonight. You say, well, I don't see any foundation. I don't see any cornerstone. I've seen pictures online of, of outer space. And, the, and listen, everything that we see is not what's real. He, uh, in, in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11, it tells us that faith is the substance of things, hope for the evidence of things not seen, and that the invisible things of God will be one day revealed. The, the worlds were created by things that are not seen, it says in Hebrews chapter 11. There's things you can't see tonight. Gravity is one of them. You can't see gravity. You can see the effect of gravity, but nobody denies that gravity exists. Well, just because you can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. There's foundations, and all these things are there because God says they are. We just can't see it with our human eyes, but it's there. But look in verse 7, speaking about creation, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. By the way, this is before Adam is made. The angels witnessed creation. I get hammered on this all the time. People say, oh, that's a you're a heretic if you believe that the angels predate 
I, people talk about pre-Adamic earth. There is a pre-Adamic earth. Pre-Adamic simply means before Adam, and there were six days, there's five days before Adam. So there's a pre-Adamic earth, getting, uh, there's no getting around it. The fishes were made before Adam. That's pre-Adam, so there's something there. I don't take it to the extreme that, I know what some of y'all are thinking, I don't take it to all that extreme, but I will say this, the angels witnessed creation. How do you know? It's right here, God speaking. God said that the sons of God shouted for joy when they witnessed the world coming into creation. I had a man get on to me one time and he just, he said, oh, you're a heretic if you don't believe that the angels were created in the creative week. And I said, show me the reference. He said, well, there's not one. I said, I got a reference that says that they were witnessing creation. So either we have to add a scripture to Genesis chapter 1 and 2 that God doesn't say was there, we have to add it, or you have to omit what God says in, in Job 38, that the angels were not there. So pick one. Or you can believe what the Bible says about it. I believe what God says about it. And I believe that, uh, that the devil fell before uh, all of that. I, there's no getting around that. But Job 38 says that the sons of God, this is a reference to the angels, witness creation. But now he even says that the, the morning stars sang together. And there's no doubt he's not talking about those gaseous bodies just like our sun that we see uh, in, the, in the daytime. That that's what's singing because he connects the stars with the angels, the sons of God. And when you get to the New Testament, you see it all through and through. You see over in Revelation where uh, Jesus said the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Jesus himself is called the morning star. He's the bright and the morning star. Uh, we see the star representing angels all in the book of Revelation. In fact, I believe that when it says that a third of the stars fall from heaven, it cannot possibly be those massive, you know, giant supernova type stars out there because it would swallow the earth up, just one of them. It can't be just a meteor because that happens almost instantaneously when it enters our atmosphere. It can't be a comet because they're moving slower. It has to be angels. And the connection, the references are all there, but that's a different study on angelology. But he says the sons of God. So they're sons of God in the Old Testament. Let me show you another reference to this son of God, though. Genesis chapter 32 and verse 24. Genesis 32 verse 24. Here's one of the great WWE, WWF references in the, uh, in the Bible. Jacob's getting ready to wrestle. Jacob, he was left alone, verse 24, and there wrestled a man with him under the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. So this man that's wrestling with Jacob touches the thigh of Jacob, and his, the hollow of his thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, so it's this man he's wrestling with, said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. This isn't an ordinary man. And he said unto him, what is thy name? It's rhetorical, just like Jesus would do when he'd talk to the disciples and ask questions that he already knew the answer to. And he said, Jacob. And he said, verse 28, thy name shall not be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And so with God, that's connecting with this man wrestling with him. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. Now this gets into the subject of the, son, uh, the angel of the Lord who is the Son of God, but is the, uh, in the form of the angel of the Lord of the Old Testament. Very interesting subject. You ought to look up. I'm not talking about an angel of the Lord, but the angel of the Lord. When you see the Bible refer to the angel of the Lord, 99% of the time, it's referring to one specific angel. And the angel is undoubtedly an appearance of the Lord, the Son of God, in the Old Testament. But here's what happens in that wrestling match. Jacob, his name's now changed to Israel. He asked him, he said, tell me your name. And he said, wherefore dost thou ask after my name? His name was not revealed. Now God's name's not hidden. They knew the name of God. They knew Adonai. They knew Elohim. They knew Jehovah. So why is he asking in his name? And why is the angel of the Lord 
declining to reveal his name because his name had not yet been revealed in the Old Testament. His name does not get revealed to the scripture we read in Isaiah chapter number 9. Look in Judges chapter 13. It happens again in Judges 13 in verse 16. Judges 13 verse 16 of the angel of the Lord. So again, not and, but the, the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I'll not eat of thy bread, and if thou offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. So it, he, he, he didn't understand. He revealed when, when the, the angel of the Lord appeared in the Old Testament, often in the disguise of the appearance of a normal man like other angels did, just like in the story of Lot. When the angels came to Lot, the men of Sodom recognized them as just men. That's why they wanted to abuse them. They, they wanted to, uh, to take those men out and to, to uh, sexually abuse them. And so th they didn't realize that those men were not just men. They, they were angels of God, that, and they smote the men with blindness. And so then those angels took Lot and his family out of Sodom. But over and over again, we see we see it even in the resurrection of Jesus. When they go to the tomb, they recognize them, the angels, as young men. Over and over again, as men or young men. So Manoah now doesn't understand this is the angel of the Lord. So he sees him as an angel of the Lord now. He realizes that. But he says, what is, verse 17, Manoah said unto thee, angel of the Lord, what is thy name? That when thy sayings come to pass, that we may do thee honor. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou after my name, seeing it is secret? God's name wasn't secret. It was up until God revealed his name by Jehovah to Moses there at the burning bush, but from that point forward, God's name wasn't secret. And they understood quite well the name of God. They knew Adonai. They knew Elohim. Like I said, they knew Jehovah. This isn't just the name of Jehovah. This is the name of that would be the name above all names. But the angel of the Lord wouldn't reveal himself as Jesus yet because he hadn't been born in Bethlehem yet. The prophecies had to come to pass. When Jesus is going to be born, then the Bible declares his name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now the secret's no longer a secret. Now we know who his name is. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now it's no more secret. In fact, now that name that's been revealed is such a name above every name that it's by the name of Jesus we get saved. By believing in the name of Jesus through his name. Jesus said, if you ask anything of my Father in my name, he'll do it. Now that's the answer, that's the key to getting prayers even answered is through that name that once was mysterious, but now we know his name. So the angel of the Lord doesn't reveal his name, but everyone in the Old Testament knew God had a son and that that son was going to be called the Son of God and would sit on the throne. Now, come to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, verse number 13. He says, You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first, and my temptation which was in my flesh you despised not nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Paul said an angel of God is as Christ Jesus. He's connecting the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord, to Jesus Christ, revealing himself, revealing his name uh, as the angel of the Lord, as Jesus Christ. And, and, and Hebrews chapter 1 deals a lot with this, which we won't take time to get into tonight. Like I said, the subject of the angel of the Lord is a separate subject. The su subject of angelology is a separate subject, but it's important. Angels of God, though, had names. They weren't secret. So why would this angel need to keep his name secret? Michael revealed his name. It wasn't a secret. Gabriel revealed his name. Old Testament and New wasn't a secret. But this angel's name was secret. But then it's going to be revealed. When the name of God's son shows up, it reveals who he is in connection with David. Matthew chapter 1, verse number 1. This is the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You see that tonight? As soon as the name is now revealed, now the line is connected, what the prophets knew before, David and Jesus. This is the book of the generation. Notice how many generations he's skipping now. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now he goes into the gene genealogy, 
but he's connecting the three, Abraham, David, Jesus. Didn't we study about Abraham and the covenant God made with him? Now we're looking at David. And that David, the Vedic covenant, is going to be connected with Jesus. All these covenants run into each other. They connect the dots together. They all are connecting the same thing. And us tonight, we are part of this covenant because we are spiritual seeds. We're not replacing Israel, none of that stuff. But we get in on the, the inheritance. We are adopted. We're engrafted, as we said before. And the Bible now calls us the same thing it calls God's sons. We're now sons and daughters of God. But in the genealogy, Matthew chapter 1, you have a sinless man connected with a sinner. David was a sinner. Jesus isn't. Adam was a sinner. Abraham was a sinner. Jesus isn't. It can't be the same direct line. It can't be the physical son entirely because of many reasons, because of sin. But I'll show you something else. Jeremiah chapter 22. God gives a prophecy about it. One of the kings, his name is Jeconiah. And Jeconiah, God says in this chapter, he said uh, the, the J-E, the prefix J-E, the Koniah, Jeconiah, stood for Jehovah. Uh, anytime you see J-E, almost always in the Bible, coming first in a name, it's connected with Jehovah, the name of the Lord. Just like you have a suffix, you'll have like a... Uh, Bethel, the, the name Bethel, um, going back to Bethel, Beth uh, and El, Beth El, El is God, just like Ja is God, at the beginning El is God, um, and Beth El means house of God, Beth, Bethlehem means house of bread, uh, and ain't that interesting, the house of bread brought forth the bread of life, but El is the name of God. Je, je, which they'd say, yeah, we say Je. But J-E, Jeconiah, God says prophetically of Jeconiah, he got tired of the kings just living in sin. And he says in verse number 28, this man, Coniah, so he's removed the J-E J part, a despised broken idol. Is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? Wherefore are they cast out, he and his seed, and are cast into a land which they know not. God said, I'm going to disperse them. I'm done. Oh, earth, 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 verse 29. That's one earth for God, one earth for God the Father, one for God the Son, one God the Holy Spirit. And also, that means God's getting your attention. You better listen to what he's saying when he repeats it three times. Oh, earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Verse 30. Thus saith the Lord, write you this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. Judah. God says, Jeconiah, forget my name. I don't even want my name associated with yours anymore. Jeconiah was the last king. And so he said, I'm not going to let any kings beyond you sit on the throne of David. They go off into disper uh, uh, they're dispersed in the diaspora. They go into Babylon. They're into captivity. And so God put a curse on the last of the kings there and said prophetically, he said, earth, 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 you better listen. No descendant anymore, any further from Jeconiah, from Coniah, can have a descendant upon the throne. Well, that goes back to David. So he's saying, I'm cutting it off. That's one of the great proofs, by the way, that Jesus Christ has to be the Son of God because if He was just the Son of Man, then this prophecy wouldn't be true. He couldn't have been just a man and then sit on the throne because God said no man's going to sit on the throne after all of what the kings did after hundreds of years of them living in disobedience. So how in the world now is David going to have a son that's going to sit on the throne? He'll have to be a supernatural son. It can't be just entirely physical. It has to be also spiritual. He can't have just a human father because the human line ran back to Jeconiah and God said, no more kings after Jeconiah. So prophetically, God said that his son, David, would have a, a, a son that would get a physical throne. I'm going to give you this last one and then we'll have to get back into it next week. 
I wanted to do it in one lesson, but there's just no way tonight. Matthew chapter 21. I mentioned this before, but Matthew chapter 21 and verse number 15. And when the chief priest and scribe saw the wonderful things that he did, speaking of Jesus, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were sore displeased, and he said unto them, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? They're in the temple. They're going around the streets. They're crying out, Palm Sunday, all of that. Hosanna, son of David. They knew that Jesus was connected with the prophecies of the son of David. And that's what was really rubbing the Pharisees the wrong way. So in chapter 22 and verse number 41, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? I mean, after all, they said earlier that he's the son of Joseph. And they said earlier that we be not born of fornications, implying that he was. So he said, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They said unto him, The son of David. They knew. They knew that the, that the Messiah was going to be the son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then called him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither does any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. That shut them up. Because they knew the Old Testament prophecies, and they knew that David was going to have a son that was going to be the Messiah. But how could his descendant be the Lord? And they couldn't respond to that. Because if his descendant was God, how does that connect with David? And so we're going to get into that with our next study and show you how they do connect physically and, and, and spiritually that Jesus does fulfill that. And what's so sad tonight is in Israel, they're still awaiting this prophecy to be fulfilled. They're still out there crying for the Messiah to be revealed. They still believe he'll be the son of David. They still know those Old Testament prophecies, but they don't believe any of them applied to Jesus. Um, I mentioned this a few weeks back, but uh, on the news in Jerusalem, it was... Um, I'm trying to think when it was. But they, they showed, you can see it on YouTube, it's all over the internet, videos of all the rabbis. And if you look at the rabbis... Um, you can tell, just like in the military, you've got rank. And you can look at the rank on the shoulders, on the, you know, on the sleeves, on their, uh, their medals. You know what, what rank. Uh, the rabbis also have kind of a, a ranking system. And this, the simple way to understand is the bigger the hat, the higher the rank. <laughs> so when you see them out there in these elaborate furry hats that look almost comical to us, those are the big shots. Those are the ones that are in charge. Those are the, you know, those are the main rabbis. And you saw all of them coming out, and you saw hundreds and then thousands going to the Wailing Wall, and they're all praising this man. And this man, I've seen pictures of him. Supposedly, they think they can trace him back to the line of David. And uh, he even goes by the name of Ben David or something like that. Uh, ben means son in Hebrew. And, uh, and so they, they believe he is going to be the Messiah. And you see them out there because they've finally been able to trace a line as far as they believe back to David. And they're praising him. They're out there kissing this man's hand. They're hoisting him in, in the air. I mean, it, it's, it's sickening to watch. It's going on today. They think he's going to be the one to fulfill those Old Testament prophecies. And you and I both know there's nothing to it. It's just wishful thinking on their part. That guy is not anything more than a man. And even if he could trace his line back to David, which I doubt highly that he could, but even if he could, God said in Jeremiah, I'm not going to allow a physical offspring any longer to sit on the throne. So he's disqualified even if he could prove that he could go back to David. But the covenant, and that's what we're going to get into as well. We're going to get into the heart of the covenant. We go to the, the book of Samuel. And we see that God makes the covenant with David, and he tells him what he's going to do. And we find that it's a great promise of 
Old Testament, we could call it eternal security because David is told, I'm going to give you sure mercies forevermore. And how, you say, well, Brother Ben, how are we going to justify that with what you just said with uh, Jeconiah and the prophecy of the kings and all that? Because God's put things on kind of pause right now, but it's still being fulfilled through Jesus Christ and it ultimately is going to be fulfilled physically even through Jesus when he comes back again. And we'll see all of that in our study next week. All right, that's all I'll give you tonight. I know I went a little long. Um, I mentioned in prayer my dad and just a, really a praise report, but also in prayer. Um, he still has to take immune therapy treatment.